Murray Rothbard rejected in the strongest terms this Marshallian attempt at a synthesis of marginalist innovations with the legacy of Ricardo, and with it he rejected Marshall's attempted synthesis of labor and waiting as elements of real cost. To understand why, we must start with Rothbard's distinction with, between the judging of actions ex ant and ex post. In judging ex ant, an actor determines which future course of action is most likely to maximize his utility. Judgment ex post, in contrast, is an assessment of the results of past action. Rothbard denied that sunken costs could confer value. Costs incurred in the past cannot confer any value now. It is evident that once the product has been made, cost has no influence on the price of the product. Post past costs being e ephemeral are irrelevant to present determination of prices. Against the doctrine of classical political economy that cost determined price, which was supposed to be the law of price determination in the long run, he argued that the truth is precisely the reverse. The price of the final product is determined by the valuations and demands of the consumers, and this price determines what the cost will be. Factor payments are the result of sales to consumers and do not determine the latter in advance. Cost of production then are at the mercy of final price and not the other way around. A revolutionary doctrine indeed, only on closer inspection it does not seem to so revolutionary after all, and the Marshall and Ricardo to whom Rothbard opposed himself so dramatically turn out to be gross caricatures. Their statement of the cost principle was nothing so crudely metaphysical as the price of the final product is determined by cost of production. Rothbard was, if anything, more charitable than Bohm Barwick, who felt compelled to deny that there, were there was power in any element of production to infuse value immediately or necessarily into its pr product. Admittedly, too, Rothbard made a half-hearted attempt at fairness in giving a slightly less cartoonish dis description of the Marshallian scissors. Marshall tried to rehabilitate the cost of production theory of the classicals by conceding that in the short run, in the immediate marketplace, consumers demand rules price, but in the long run, among the important reproducible goods, cost of the production is determining, according to Marshall, both utility and money costs determine price, like blades of a scissor, but one blade is more important in short run and another in the long run. But he immediately proceeded to tear Marshall's doctrine apart, or rather a character of it, in this strawman version of Marshall, a modern counterpart of the scholastic realists of the Middle Ages, the long run was a phenomenon with concrete existence. Marshall's analysis suffers from a grave methodological defect, indeed from an almost hopeless methodological confusion as regards the short run and the long run. He considers the long run as actually existing as being the permanent, persistent, observable element beneath the fitful, basically unimportant flux of market value. Marshall's conception of the long run is completely fallacious and thus eliminates the whole groundwork of his theoretical structure. The long run, by its very nation, never does and never can exist. To analyze the determining force in a world of change, the economist must construct hypothetically a world of non-change, i.e. evenly rotating economy. This is far different from saying the, the long run exists or that it is somehow more permanently or more persistently existent than the actual market data. The fact that costs equal prices in the long run does not mean that costs will actually equal prices, but that the tendency exists a tendency that is continually being disrupted in reality by the very fitful changes in market data that Marshall points out. We have already seen, by the way, that Marshall's long run is not equivalent to Austrian's hypothetical world of non-change, or ERE, but rather to the Austrian's final equilibrium towards which the economy tends but never approaches. Compare Rothbard's version of Marshall to what Marshall himself said, as we have already quoted him above. 
but in real life such oscillations are seldom as rhythmical as those of a stone hanging freely from a string. The comparison would be more exact if the string were supposed to hang in the troubles, wa troubled waters of a mill race whose stream was at one time allowed to flow freely, and at another particularly cut off, for indeed the demand and supply schedules do not in practice remain unchanged for a long time together but are constantly being changed and every change in them alters the equilibrium amount and the equilibrium price and thus gives new positions to centers about which the amount and price tends to oscillate. There is a constant tendency towards a position of natural equilibrium in which the supply of each of these agents, i.e. factors of production, will stand in such a relation to demand for its services as it to give to those who have provided the supply a sufficient reward for their efforts and sacrifices. If the economic conditions of the country remain stationary sufficiently long, this tendency would realize itself in such an adjustment of supply to demand that both machines and human beings would earn generally an amount that corresponds fairly with their cost of rearing and training. As it is, the economic conditions of the country are constantly changing and the point of adjustment of normal demand and supply in relation to labor is constantly being shifted. More important than the deviation of most prices from their normal value at any given time is the fact that they will tend towards this value over time, if not embedded by monopolistic privilege, as Schumpeter wrote, although there were, may always be positive average rates of profit. It is sufficient that the profit of every individual plant is in incessantly threatened by actual or potential competition from new commodities uh, or methods of production which sooner or later will turn it into a loss. The price trajectory of any particular capital of consumer good under the influence of competition will be toward cost. For no individual assemblage of capital goods remains a source of surplus gains forever. Or in other words, t of tuck or in the words of Tucker, competition is the greater leveler of prices to the labor of cost of production. Setting aside Rothbard's character of Marshall's views, i.e. his supposed views of the long run as actually existing in some real sense as a static model like the evenly rotating economy, we shall find, or we found, we find that Marshall actually said something quite like what Rothbard said. The price of reproducible goods tends towards the cost of production. Equilibrium price and the long run, like the Austrians find equilibrium, are not viewed in conceptual realist terms as actually existing things. Rather, they are theoretical constructs for making the real world, world phenomena more comprehensible. The Austrian pose of radical skepticism when it is ideologically convenient effectively deprives economists of the ability to make useful generalizations about observed regularities in the phenomena of the real world. The problem with Rothbard's critique of Marshall is that it could be applied with almost as much justice to Rothbard himself. For example, Rothbard admitted that cost of production could have an indirect effect on price through its effect on supply. In this, in his discussion of the distinction between ex ante and ex post judgments from which we quoted above, he also proclaimed it clear that the actor's ex post judgments are mainly useful to him in the weighing of his ex ante considerations for future actions, and directly after his statements quoted above that cost has no influence on the product price of the product. He went on a, at great length. The cost to have an influence in production is not denied by anyone. However, the influence is not directly on the price, but on the amount that will be produced, or more specifically on the degree to which factors will be used. 
the height of costs on individual value scales then is one of the determinants of quantity. The stock that will be produced, this stock of course later plays a role in determination in the determination of market price. This however is a far cry from stating that cost either determines or is coordinate with utility in determining price. But this is almost exactly how Marshall himself explained the action of the cost principle. At length, in his discussion of Yevon's critique of Ricardo in, a, in Appendix 1 of Principles of Economics, indeed one can find many passages uh, in the Principles of Economics in which Marshall described the action of cost on price through supply in language almost identical to that of Rothbard above. Marshall did not claim that the price of a specific present good was a mystical determined by its past cost of production. He heard he argued rather that prices over time tended toward the cost of production through the decisions of producers as whether market prices justified future production. And the Austrians attached some very comp compromising qualifications to their bold statements that utility determined value and that final price determined the cost of production. Von Barwick in the positive theory wrote that value was determined by the importance of that concrete want, which is least urgent among the wants that are met from the available stocks of similar goods, emphasize, emphasis added. Rothbard wrote that the prices of a good is determined by its total stock in existence and the demand scheduled for it on the market, emphasis added. Likewise, in the real world of immediate markets, prices, it is obvious to all that prices is, is solely determined by valuations of stock by utilities and it not at all by money cost. Most economists recognize that in the real world the so-called short run cost cannot determine price. This sounds awfully similar in practice to Marshall's understanding of the predominance of the utility blade of sciz the scissors in the short run. The difference, as we saw above, was that Rothbard denounced that very idea of the long run as utterly meaningless. Rothbard's qualifications of the utility principle suggests a weakness of the subjective theory of value which we have recurrent, recurrently pointed to in sections above. It can be taken literally only to the extent that we ignore the dynamic aspect of supply and treat the balance between demand and existing stocks of supply at any point as given without regard to the time factor.